Hey guys, what's up? Craig from Bass Lessons Melbourne here. Welcome to the last episode of 2020 for the Player Profile Podcast. This is number 61. Um, and it's a bit of a special end of year treat for you all because it's a three-parter. Um, this episode features three Aussie legend bass players. Well, two and a half really. One of them, Roger McLaughlin, was originally born in New Zealand, but he, uh, like myself, not born in New Zealand, but he, like myself, calls Australia home. So in this episode, we have Roger McLaughlin, Craig Newman, and Harry Bruce. Um, if you're from these parts, as they say, then you're probably familiar with these names. Um, they've been, they're all over the radio, all over the TV. If you're not familiar, then please enjoy this podcast because you're going to find out a whole bunch of fascinating history about these guys. Um, this has been quite a year. Um, my rate of podcast offerings has dropped considerably. I apologize for that, but um, just the nature of the beast at the moment with um, not many guys coming through here touring, so it has to be done via um, you know, Zoom or Skype or whatever, which is fine, but I do prefer the face-to-face interaction, so I haven't really been lining heaps of them up. Um, and then also, I've been uh, busy being a dad and releasing three singles and an album with my band, um, one of which you are listening to right now. It's called Bootstomp, and it's on the brand new Pickpocket album, Refraction, which you can find on Spotify and on Bandcamp. So i um, pretty proud of this one. Um, check it out if you like the kind of funky fusion music. As always, this podcast is brought to you in part with F-Bass. Um, F-Bass have been handcrafting amazing guitars and basses for over 40 years with contemporary and vintage inspired designs. If you're in the market for a new instrument, head on over to fbass.com um, and I'm sure you will find something that fits what you're looking for. Um, I'm going to split this um, interview, or this hang really, into three parts. Essentially what this is, was during lockdown, I um, I organized a bunch of uh, Zoom hangs with bass players, and I live broadcasted that, if that's even a word, broadcasted live to um, uh, the Melbourne Bass Players Facebook group, which is a kind of local Facebook group down here in Melbourne. So I had a bunch of local guys on, some guys from interstate, and we just kind of hung out and talked about live bass music on a Saturday night when we would have normally been gigging. Nobody had any gigs, so um, this one I've decided to release as a podcast episode because it's nearly three hours long and um, and these guys are, are kind of, you know, legendary throughout these circles. So I'll, I'll chop it down into three one-hour parts. This is part one. Um, I really appreciate everybody listening. I hope you enjoy it. This is episode 61, part one. Harry Bruss, Roger McLaughlin, and Craig Newman. Thanks for listening, guys. I want to say, first of all, thanks to you three guys for joining me on this adventure. You might regret it. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> thanks for having us, Craig. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I've been, you know, kind of... No, I can. I think I've met you, Roger, a couple of times, Craig, and I've met you once, Harry. I haven't met you, but you know, definitely aware of you. So Harry's the man. Wherever you are, you're my bottom left. <laughs> yeah, Harry me. Bruce, you're my hero, man. Oh, uh, man, um, so uh, so you say that you are I'm a big fan of yours as well, mate. Oh, it's lovely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, some of the stuff you've done would blow me up. Oh, thanks, man. Keep, keep yes. it. So we need to, we need to stay 1.5 meters apart in this. <laughs> no <laughs> hugs. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same with Craig. I mean, he's been one of my heroes for a long time. I used to watch Hey Hey, and uh, I used to go, "Wow, that was sensational." I felt actually uh, inspired by the way Craig was so smooth and classy. I always really? felt like I was, I was ham-fisted compared to that, but you know. Yeah, he, well, he has that effect, doesn't he, Craig? 
He sure does. Just coming <laughs> up there, up there, ploughing through the chart. Me, I'm an okay reader, but Craig just up there nailing the stuff. You know, uh, inspiring. Well, you guys are inspiring, so it's a pleasure. You know, hey. absolutely. Yeah. So, how has this COVID quarantine lockdown affected you, three gentlemen? Um, how have you, you know, what's been, what's been bad and what's been good? Uh, what's well, been good? It's been, you know what? It's actually been great for me. I, I know this sounds weird. I haven't really missed playing live. Well, Which is weird mean? because I love playing live. But, but I know it's weird, but the reality is I've been doing a lot of ISO recording for um, for Jeff Atchison and and Steve Romming. So, you know, it, it's it's enabled me to sort out my vinyl collection. I've been archiving VHS, uh, <laughs> buying new bases, you know, and learning how to use Final Cut Pro. So, yeah. in actual fact, it's been a lot of fun. And, of course, I started my isolated bass series, and, and uh, that's just been fantastic, you know. Yeah. So, it's, it's been very productive for me, you know, and I, I haven't, some in a strange way, I haven't missed going out playing. I think probably because I have been playing, still creative, you know. Yeah, that's it. And um, getting used to, I mean, Final Cut Pro is um, a lot to get your head around, so... Yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah, I kind of got my head around, you know, uh, iMovie, but uh, and and I'm it's like going from Garage Band to Logic Audio, you know. But I bet there's a lot of cool things about Final Cut Pro, you know. I mean, I've just scratched the surface, but so many things I was got frustrated trying to do in, in iMovie, you know, had to go. Uh, and of course, we, when we went into isolation, Apple gave you a a three month free trial. Ah, smart. Yeah, paid for it, smart. Yeah, so yeah, I'll jump on that. So I've only just paid for it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, mate, it's been great. I've been been very happy here. I've been can't believe I've bought three bases this year so far. <laughs> and I, believe me, I had I if we had not been in isolation, I probably wouldn't have bought them. <laughs> it's <bizarre. laughs> That's good. A few people are saying hello. Um, Richard Rose says hi, Harry. Hey, Richard, uh, one of my favourite bass players, Richard. Ah, there you go. Um, Julian Chick, Joe Fata. Got some people hanging Dale out. Dale Powers, how you doing, Dale? Dale was one of my students. Oh, oh cool. Um, if we had not been in isolation, I probably wouldn't have bought them. There we go. Yeah. What? Uh, <laughs> it's the video yeah, playback. I just heard an echo. Who says, hi, Harry. Hey Richard, uh, one of my favourite bass players, Richard. Craig, uh, can you can you mute um, the video? Julian Chick, Joe Fata. Me. Or oh, somebody. People hanging Dale out. Dale Paz, how you doing, Dale? Who's been uh, one of my students? I don't understand that. I'm totally muted over here. <laughs> we are not being in isolation. I'm probably with the ball. Where's that coming up from? What? Uh, <laughs> I think we're on a loop now. <laughs> Ah, uh, it's, it's coming through. It's coming through yours, Craig. Julian Chick, mute. I just, I'll just, I've just muted that Craig's window while he figures that out. Yes. Good. Good. Oh, sorry, Roger. You're muted. <laughs> it all went <laughs> muted. Ask to unmute. No, we can't. We can't hear you, Roger. <laughs> wow. So, how are you? You've got a few gigs going on up in Sydney at the moment. Yeah, well, I got a couple this weekend, uh, which I'm looking forward to. Uh, Sydney, I guess, is some sort of getting back into it. But it'll ne it'll be. I don't know. It'll never get back to what it was. But yeah. I think we're creeping in with the uh, with the gigs, and and people are actually coming. I think they're missing it big time. So, yeah. so, we're, so we're getting some good crowds and uh, people interested, and I hope it's uh, not too long before you guys are out there doing it again as well. Yeah, it could be a while. Yeah, it's uh, everything has changed forever. I think mm. all the, the culture of uh, dancing. I mean, it's hard to go to gigs; you're not allowed to dance. You know. Yeah. Wow. So you just go and check out jazz gigs. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know. We'll miss. Well, uh, yeah, it, hopefully it'll all be coming back 
after Christmas or whenever, you know. Yeah, yeah. Who knows? Um, Craig, how, how have you managed to maintain work life? Um, well, you know, I mean, the only thing that's really stopped is is the live gigs, which obviously, um, you know, uh, that's a that's a big thing. But um, apart from that, I'm just doing what I normally do. Um, I've had a good run of sessions that I do from home. Cool. Um, recording bass tracks for people and also um, I have a few clients that record here so I get to do a bit of mixing and that sort of stuff um, and obviously all my students I, I've transferred that to online teaching mm. uh, which took a couple of weeks a few weeks to get comfortable with and, and as comfortable as you can get yeah how, how, how do you find it because obviously I'm doing all, all my teaching online now as well and well, I really miss the interaction, sitting with a student and, and playing. So the student can watch you play, you can play together. Yeah, um, I, think, I think that's the biggest thing for me, is not being able to play with, with a student, giving them that kind of safety net of yeah. Yeah. knowing what it's like to play that line or whatever it is with you, or giving them a backing. But what I have done is, um, you know, I get them to, if, if we're working on a piece or working on a, a solo piece or something, I'll get them to record a video and send it to me, I can have a look at it, give it feedback, or I can do a short video, send it to them. Yep. A bit of that helps. Yeah. So, so what, what, um, what kind of... Um... And, and one great thing is, you know, uh, <clears throat> not doing the live gigs, for me, is I'm, I'm not constantly learning, having to learn a whole lot of different repertoires. I can actually spend some time working on stuff that, you know, I want to work on and not have to worry about, okay, this week I've got four different gigs, three different repertoires, whatever, you know. So a, a break from that is good. I mean, I've yeah. been gigging consistently for a long time. So, And this is the first time I've ever had a break from not working live. Yeah. So does I this mean that the... Um we're all on that boat. Well, yeah. Well. yeah. So, does this mean you've got a solo album in the works then? Uh, no, I've got a few ideas, but I, I do have a few, a uh, couple of instrumental bands that I work with on the side, and we're recording some tracks. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, just getting a chance to uh, finish off, finish off some transcriptions that I've been working on for a while and just being able to uh, disappear into that world. Yeah, anything um, anything we'd know? Oh, just uh, a, a few uh, bass things and uh, Clifford Brown solo that I'm working on at the moment. Right, because you, you play uh, upright as well? Uh, yeah, I do. I wouldn't call myself an upright bass player. Yep. Yeah. No, I, I, I studied upright bass when I was at the College of the Arts with a fabulous um, teacher, Marion Breischer, who taught a lot of Melbourne bass players. Mm -hmm. He was a classical, incredible classical bass player. So uh, I did three years with him, uh, doing all the bowing and working through the Samantha book. Wow. But then but I just I got so busy on electric bass that uh, you know I just spent most of my time on that. Yeah, is that so? Electric bass is really that's yeah, high yeah, high. for sure. Yeah, yeah. What about you, you, Harry? Do you do you play upright at all? Oh no, I fool around with it, but I feel upright is you you either play upright or you don't. So, yeah. so I fool around. I fool around with it, you know. Harry, tell him about your new bass you got. I got one of those Steinberger NS4M, which is unbelievably sweet to play because uh, being, I play it with the neck facing down instead of up. So, I saw you playing it a couple of days ago, Harry, that way. Yeah, yeah. It was, very, it was amazing. Very comfortable, you know. It's like uh, early days, uh, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, in a few months when I get a bit of a handle on it, I'm going to ball with it, you know. Great. Because the sound it, ro it roars, you know. So is that, is that the like the upright stick 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, Ned, well, you know, it's the Ned Steinberger one, yeah? Yeah, you would have seen it many times because it's been around for a while now. Yeah. yeah. But, but uh, I wanted one for a while because I had a cheap Palatino for a while and uh, it was okay, but this thing is like a Porsche compared to that. <laughs> Roger, did you play up, right? I had, look, no, I've dabbled in it. I, I've... Robbie Little had one of those uh, NS upright five strings and uh, I borrowed it from him for a week or so to get used to it, just to record it on a track and it was hard work, you know, really. The, the, the distance between the no, I'm trying to play it, you know, one finger per fret, that doesn't work, you know. <laughs> and just getting the, getting a little sucker in tune, you know. So, But it forced me to simplify my part, you know. So I'm very happy with the end result, you know. But it was uh, a lot of takes to get it the way, uh, to get it absolutely schmicko. If I'm going to dabble in that area, you know, I just play fretless bass. That's kind of my, you know, that's it's my down. weapon of choice. Well, the bass on the voice, mate, that's incredible. Yes. Well, thank you, man. And look, there it is. Oh. Mate, hey, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's almost as uh, iconic as that Paul Young song, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it's quite a unique uh, bass, really. Uh, I mean, it's the first Fender I ever bought. I bought this in Dunedin, New Zealand in 1974 when I got a gig as a bass player to come to Australia to do a, a tour around Australia with Godspell. It had frets in it then. And so by 70, so this is the bass you hear on the first two LRB albums and the Stars Paradise album. And, of course, late 78, 79, I took the frets out and it became fretless and, of course kind of uh, popped its, reared its ugly head and uh, John Farnham's You're the Voice, you know, so there it is. Um, is it all stock? No, it's not, mate. It's got a badass bridge on it. I put I put the badass bridge on myself one day and it's got wood screws in it. I mean, there's nothing fancy about it, you know, and it's got uh, Grovers on it. Grovers? Haven't had them in a while. Yeah, both my fenders have got Grovers. They were the, the in thing, you know. Got, they're very smooth. They've got a nice, or oh, maybe similar gearing, but they just feel nice. Um, yeah, but turning this thing into a fretless was almost a disaster. I, I'm trying to remember the guy, because I knew you would ask me that, the guy that did it. It was a mad, because it's got binding, you had to pull the frets out, uh, you know, kind of even the fingerboard. Where the frets were, he put like a little chocolate-coloured resin or something in there, and then put this two-tin epoxy resin over the top of it and handed it back to me and I'll be playing it for about a week and it started to bubble, it started to lift off the the black block inlays, it didn't stick. It started to bubble, you know, you could see it was lifting so I, I had to send it back to him and uh, he stripped it all off and, and redid it again, you know, and that's that was in the late 70s, you know. Here I was thinking all those years that it was Greg McCain's playing that bass part. <laughs> I know. Yeah, right. <laughs> He's all right. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's funny, that, isn't it? Somebody else mentioned that to me the other day. That God, I didn't realise it was you. And I think it's got a Seymour Duncan quarter pounder in the back. Oh. And of course, I took the scratch plate off it because that's what Jacko did, and Jacko's pretty cool, so I thought I'll take the scratch plate off it. So, yeah, there it is. Cool. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple of questions already. Uh Richard wants to know, Craig, how did you get the Hey Hey at Saturday gig? What was that all about? Um, boy, uh, when was that? Um, it was just a few years ago, wasn't it? Yeah, that was like uh, 1990, I think. So 1990, something like that. Um, well, uh, Kim May, beautiful Melbourne bass player, was doing hmm. that gig. And uh, for, some, for some reason, he was moving on. Um, and uh, at that time, Daryl McKenzie was the musical director, great arranger, a musical director. Um, and we'd done a few gigs together. Uh, and um, Daryl put me in for that gig. So that's, that's how I landed that gig. Um, but before that, you know, uh, my first TV gig would have been on a show called New Faces, which... Um, Roger, you used to do, yeah? I did that, so you might have done it before me. 
I, so I, I, know, I know I did it with Bert at at, uh, at the old Channel Ten out in Nunawari, and I'm sure that was the nineties. Yeah, and uh, I, I did a fill in for you one day, I think. Oh, okay. Um, what was gig? <laughs> so that was uh, yeah, that was my first TV gig. But then oh, really, the, uh, the Hey Hey show came along, and uh, that come after that then. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. So it was through my association with Daryl McKenzie. Uh, we went, you know, worked at the College of the Arts together. We played in different bands, and I've been working with Daryl ever since on different shows. Um, and that, you know, that was an incredible gig. It was an incredible time for live TV because um, it was. Yeah. In those days, you would just the show would go live to air normally at six thirty on a Saturday night. We would be called in at like 3.30 in the afternoon. Um, and most of the time you, you never knew what you would be, be playing or who you were backing. You, you know, you, you, heard a, uh, you might hear a rumour that Tom Jones is in town and he's going to do the show. And uh, just be there at 3.30 and, and Tom's MD will come along with the charts and everything will be cool. Um, so there was a lot of that. There was a lot of like reading on the spot. Mm. So you must, be, you must have met some incredible uh, world famous musicians on that show. Well, yeah, it was it was oh, hell yeah, always. But um, it took me quite quite a while to get comfortable, you know, playing a live TV show every week and and not knowing what you were going to be playing until the day, because you're yeah. in the hands of, you you're also in the hands of whoever's done the uh, arrangement or the chart, and you would know this a lot, Roger, and, and you know, you're playing the chart and you, oh, it, this isn't quite right, what is it? Yeah. But, you know, and you, don't, you just don't have enough time to actually, you know, things like yeah. that. Yeah, nerve-wracking stuff, mate. Nerve-wracking, like. and, and it took me a while to get used to, you know, the fact that you were playing on live TV and there's cameras everywhere and you've got to be aware of what's going on and what you're doing. Um, so it took a couple of years to get comfortable with that. And, and it was a great band, you know, Darren Furrier on drums, Simon Patterson yeah. on guitar. Um, yeah, lots of different people went through it. band, yeah. How, how long did you hold that chair for? Uh, until Hey Hey finished in 1999. Wow. Ten years. Uh, <laughs> nine years, yeah. Yeah. I've got that last, I've got the last Hey Hey at Saturday on VHS tape, actually. Yeah, I remember doing that show. It was a big, big show and there was um, a lot of bands on. And it was also a great time in TV where session singers could come in and do tracks and artists from Melbourne or, or Australia could come in and get a chance to do stuff live. Mm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, uh, you know, I'm not from here, as you guys probably know. So, like, Hey Hey is kind of a, a new thing. Well, not a new thing, but I hear people talking about it all the time. So, I mean, would you would you say it was like a, a launching pad for a lot of people's careers who were either featured on it or maybe who were in the band? I mean, obviously Darren and stuff well, like that. Well, yeah, but, uh, you know, there was also shows going on before that, which, right. you know, uh, my one of my bass teachers, a uh, lovely bass player called Bob Arrowsmith, who you would know, Roger, I don't know yeah. if you know, yeah, he was. He was there. He was like he was yeah. like the you know the bass player doing. He was on every station at one stage. And he had that thing, the precision sound that cut oh, through. Man, you know, he was a great. He didn't hold back at all. Yeah, a monster. So yeah. he was the original bass player in Hey Hey. Um, uh, well, he, he, he was way back, back when Des McKenna was playing drums. Animal. Yeah, back but. Back then. But more so, yeah, but then more so, you know, Ronnie Sandlands. With Ronnie, yeah, exactly. Um, and Bob was also my teacher for uh, a while. Yeah. Um, and I would follow, this is way before I started with Hey Hey, I would follow, I would go to Bobby's gigs and he'd be uh, playing with the uh, Graham Lyle band, all the orchestras that were doing live gigs. There were live pub gigs with, you know, 20-piece bands. Um, and, he, had, uh, he had that 70s boogaloo feel too. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
Now, Craig, didn't at that time didn't you play? Um, um, were you were you in WJAZ? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you come down and watch that. Well, yeah, watch you. Okay. Got. Well, you know that that was another great part of my life. Um, sure. Yeah. That was w, WJZ Z is my wife's band. She put that together. Yeah. Um, and the and that was a, a like a ten piece funk band with uh, three session singers up the front. Uh, and we would be playing um, you know stuff by the Crusaders, Steely Dan, Kenny yeah, Lock. Yeah. Very very cool band. And uh, when I when I joined that band, I. I bought a lot of uh, Luther Vandross. I was I was just soaking myself in, um, you know, Marcus Miller stuff at that time, and uh, you know the David Sanborn, Grover Washington, mm -hmm. um, and Luther Vandross, who uh, Marcus produced, you know, most of Luther's stuff. So it gave me a chance to play that stuff live for every Saturday night for nine years or something yeah but how i got that gig was you know i have to thank uh, another fantastic bass player stephen hadley for that who um who not only did he introduce me to that gig but he also introduced my wife penny dyer whose band it was so um i had a lot for that yeah. um and then at the same time i started doing you know, four nights a week with uh, Wilbur Wild doing um, the jazz clubs um, because he was on TV. He had a, you know, he had a name. Uh, you know, we would do three or four nights a week to packed clubs, and and, and uh, that was that was fantastic because it was all a lot of it was bebop. You know, Wilbur was flying like he was playing. Beautiful. So I got a chance to play with Charlie Parker and and uh, a lot of jazz stuff. So it really gave me. It was a whole other. Were you were you playing that on electric? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Did you ever get? But, you, ever but, but I, you know, I had to really work on that stuff. Like, yeah. you know, I just saturated myself in in all of that stuff. That whole period, from the uh, that was sort of late eighties to you know in the 90s and, and there were so many other things going on you know i started touring in the 90s mm -hmm. um i i did a uh, world tour with kyle m minogue in 91 it was the rhythm of love tour wow. yeah. let's talk about that <laughs> did so you i had you know i had to go away from hey hey for a bit and yeah different people would fill in for me i mean 91 that would be when kylie was <clears throat> That was the uh, Rhythm of Love tour with, you know, when she was doing all the Stock Aiken, Waterman stuff. Massive, huge. Well, they were, they were the biggest, for someone that, who'd never been on tour before, to go to Japan or, or play at Wembley. Uh, yeah, you know, played Wembley. Everyone's screaming so much you can't even hear the click track at the start of the show. Wow. Was, Who was on drums? At that stage, it was... Uh, Johnny Creech, who plays yeah, with Johnny Russell. Johnny Creech, the Creech. <laughs> the yeah. Creech is my favourite people. Uh, well, I played with Johnny for many years with Keith Cotton, Russell Morris and all that. Yeah, of course, of course, yeah. Now, he's wonderful to play with because he, yeah. he had the flavour of those years. Yeah, and um, Adrian Scott was the musical director. Right, he was too, yeah. Yep, and uh, I did that tour. It was over two years, but there were only short stints. We would go away for three or four weeks to London come back to New Zealand, Australia, a few uh, months off, uh, another, and then go to Japan. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So that, that was all sort of happening in the 90s, you know, so it was just, and then, and then, you know, 95, I, I went and did all of the same venues in the UK that I, I did with Kylie, I did with, on the um, Seekers Farewell Tour. Wow. So yeah, so you really were in the right place at the right time with the uh, the right experience. Yeah, well, it was, it's it's just um, Craig was the young gun round town getting all the gigs. Well, it was just uh, different <laughs> musical directors, but yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. what sweet voice Judith Durham's got? Wonderful voice. Yeah, well, I still I've, I've been working with Judith up until 
she stopped working about six years ago. I, I've done her tours as well. You know. Incredible voice. Have you, yeah. have you all played with Renee Gear? The only time that I've played with Renee is on the. Uh, I did. I did uh, a John Foreman show for a year called The Big Night In. Yeah, that was a great. That was good. Yeah, that was great. Um, and Renee was on that one night, and we had to do a song, and I, like I was shitting myself. <laughs> <laughs> but um, luckily, she didn't give me any grief. But I, I remember her giving um, Jerry, who was playing drums, not for any reason. He was doing what he always does. You know, fantastic. Yeah, Jerry Fantasus. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, yep. Yeah. He, he got he copped a little bit, but and I was all good. You know, it was fine. I started with her when she was nineteen. Yeah, so you can imagine uh, the most incredible times of my life were probably with her. In the sense that a gig with her, you you could come out on another planet just from being in that soulful atmosphere that she yeah. got to okay. going. Absolutely. So it was. Um, I feel very lucky playing with her for all those years because. So exciting to get. She never took a set list on stage. It was just like, let's go. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Didn't know what was going to happen. And she was the sort of performer that would go into the bridge, just give you a look and I'm going to the bridge. So <laughs> I would have to go because no one else would have the guts to go. <laughs> <laughs> so I, would, I would take the initiative because all those years with her, I, I got to read her. Pretty, yeah. pretty well, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's the life of a bass player. That, I mean, keyboard players, guitar players, they can wait and come in on beat two, you know. Oh, is it the bridge? There we go. But bass players, we, we need to change on, on beat yeah. one of that next section. Well, yeah, that, that kind of gets back to, you know, like bass players have really got to know the arrangements to tunes because, man, if you go to, you go to a bridge or a chorus, you know, when you're not supposed to or you hit the wrong root note, well, I've got to tell you about about a, a, a yes, Beatles Craig. gig. A Beatles gig I did at the Opera House with all all the guys that they usually do with the orchestra, and Alan Mansfield, who is an incredible keyboard player, he was the guy playing with Dragon all those years. Yeah, he played with Robert Palmer for about fifteen years, touring the world with Robert. And basically, he was doing this beginning of a song, an intro, and something from the top of his keyboard hit the key. And the orchestra took that as one. This is the opera house with <laughs> packed, <laughs> packed audience, right? And, and the whole audience and the orchestra's taken this as one. So I knew, I felt, I knew what was going on. So I did this massive slide on the bass <laughs> that took it onto the beat. I forced the orchestra onto our beat. Wow. That's the bass right there. Because I can imagine if I hadn't have done that, it would have been a train wreck, you know. Yeah. Brave. That's brave. <laughs> but you have to, obviously, you know, bass players have to think like... They have to be brave, I think. I quite agree, Harry. Uh, you know, we wish... Bass players are secretly driving the band. I say it's like driving the bus, but you're in the back seat driving the bus. <laughs> it, you know, everyone is actually listening to the bass player for, for the cues a lot of the time, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, so we, yeah, we, we like to think Craig. so. Sorry, Craig. We like to think so. Oh no, it's bloody well true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mate, I've got to tell you a couple of uh, back in Renee when I started with her in '73. We're doing the Rocks Push, and um, basically a guy called Greg Quill, who had a band called Country Radio, came in with some very strong hash. So he turned us on, and I'm on stage with Renee, and all at once we turn around. And on the piano is, is Leon Russell. He's walked in the front door with all his hair and all that. Walk, yeah. Walked in the front door, saw the piano on stage and gone. And Carl Radel came to the bass section. So, I mean, this is after a big joint. I thought, is this really happening? <laughs> <laughs> Leon Russell and Carl Radel, what do you do, you know? But it was happening. It was fantastic. One of, it was one of those, you know, in those days, the whoever was in town would go to the gig that was basically yeah. happening. So you got to meet some great, and then they'd all get up for a play. And it was about, I got to jam with Billy Preston for a whole week because I was at Checkers 
in in the house band in the uh, or the late band and, and yeah. he'd do his show and then he would hang around for two sets with us and on his B three and play the whole two sets with us rather than go and party or go to a hotel room, whatever. He yeah. still came. So that was amazing, you know, have a B three roaring on two Leslies, it was just yeah. fantastic. Wow. So, Harry, you played with Renee. You, did you play it as was it the basement round about 73, 74? Were you with Renee then? Oh, there was no basement then. But what, was it, what was it called, that club, though? In the uh, um, I don't know. Well, basically, in 73, we used to play all the venues. We'd go down to Melbourne and tour, and that was Mother yeah. Earth. That was, not, that was like a, a band rather than Renee, you see. Yeah, because the only reason I say that is 1973, I did a piano cruise. Here's a bit of trivia for you. I did a piano cruise that went, you know, from Auckland, um, Sydney, New, New Meal, a token, then back to Auckland. But I played in this band, a local band from Invercargill, New Zealand, as the keyboard player. <laughs> So I was playing keyboards, but I remember we got to Sydney, long story short, and it was like, hey, where do we go and see bands? Said, well, you've got to go down to this club somewhere, one of the main... It was, was Whiskey A Go Go. That's, that was the place. Yeah, but I remember going in, somebody like, you've got to go because this, this amazing female singer is singing in this band. And so it was Renee Gaya that I saw, and you know, that would have been 1973. Yeah, that would have been... The, our band, Mother Earth. Yeah, Russell. man, I, I remember that. Just sitting in the you know, this young, young, young kid, you know, watching this amazing band. But this, this, yeah. You know, I mean, Renee. Not only was she singing fantastic, she looked fantastic. You know, she would have been about eighteen then. Yeah. Yeah, like, tall, tall, and you know, built. Built, yes. Leave it there. Yeah. <laughs> so that was the first time I ever saw Renee go. You know, that's probably before she recorded any major hits. You know. Well, she said in her book that I, she, that I was embarrassed of her because when we went to Melbourne, <laughs> instead of hanging with her, I'd be far away from her and not having to deal with it. So it was funny because we, we, we sort of had a love-hate relationship, but we talked maybe a few days ago on her birthday, so she was pretty up then. So we're, really, we're always close no matter what yeah. happened. Oh, well, that's good, man, yeah, because we've all heard some horrendous stories. You know, Mel Logan, who worked with her for years, is... Uh, Told me some uh, some wonderful tales. You know, that's when I guess when Barry Sullivan was playing bass in the band. You know, what yeah, amazing. you know, you, you, Barry, you, you can easily get intimidated by Renee, but she loves it for you to stand up to her. You know, yeah, there you go. I I've never actually worked in a band with her. I've obviously, like Craig, I, I've uh, I've backed her in a like a live TV show or something. You know, under the baton of Ross Burton and a variety show. And uh, it was the first time, well, obviously I'd seen her, heard her play and you know, records and that, but to actually be in the room, uh, and it was, what I'm trying to say is it was painfully obvious what an amazing singer and what an amazing depth and timber she has to her voice. You know, when you're in the pit and, and flying through charts and playing stuff, and various singers are going past and it's all a bit ho-hum and all of a sudden Renee Gaya steps, this is a rehearsal, Renee Gaya steps out and grabs the mic and starts to sing and it's like, oh, what is that? Like this voice is this loud and this wide, you know? One of the reasons I got the gig with Renee is basically she idolised Wendy Saddington. Who yeah, when, when, yeah. Wendy, uh, seriously, as a blues singer, there was no one, has never been one like that ever again. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so Renee was a big fan and she <laughs> saw our band Copper Wine with uh, Wendy and then that's why how I got the gig because uh, I was lucky enough to work with, with such great singers. Yeah, well, exactly. It's, but, uh, yeah, you've had an amazing career. How well, you know, the, the only other, the, well, you know, I guess... Uh, it's great to still be out there gigging because yeah. I, feel, I, I feel every gig is a bonus. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, Harry, do you know a bass player called Tim Kernick? Oh, yeah, he's one of my favourites, man. He's a group he's, man. Um, he, he wants to get your hair stories. <laughs> All right. Well, this, they're great, actually. You know, uh, hair, it was the most amazing experience because... Uh, you uh, sat on top of the show, so you were in full view of the audience sitting there playing your instrument. You were part of the show. 
and uh, basically I got a call and they said, listen, uh, our bass player has broken his arm. So we, we need you to come and see if you'd like to do the show, you know, in, in the future. The bass player was a, a fella called Reno from Compulsion. He was with the Lardy Dars as well. Oh, so wow. There you he, go. Was, he was the man that uh, tripped on acid and went into his own bank with a gun and robbed it. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, and the cashier knew him. <laughs> so, so basically, a few hours later, the police arrived at his house where he was in the front room counting the money. <laughs> So he was deported. Anyway, he broke, <laughs> he broke his arm because he was tripping and walked straight off the scaffold, the scaffolding that we were on. Wow. So I came in to have a look at the show and, and Patrick basically said, the musical director said, listen, no, I hate to put this on to you, but you have to play the show tonight. So I had, to, I had reams of all uh, the music in front of me. Not that I read, I don't read one note. So basically, I just followed the chord charts and I said, no worries. So, yeah, because I think when you're young, you think, yeah, great. It's a, it's a challenge and, you know, you're fantastic. I'll do it. No, no worries. You know? So I, the, fa the best thing about it in those days, I was only, what, uh, 20. So there was, uh, in the interval, there was a nude scene with, with so, so many new boiled, beautiful girls there. And the curtain would come down and I would scurry down the stairs and just hang with all the gorgeous girls. And that was pretty amazing times. Fabulous, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> and the funny thing is, while we were playing ballads, we would actually hop past joints while we were playing, fretting with one hand and passing the joint with the other to the guitar player and the keyboard player. This is in full view of the audience, and the audience thought, oh, geez, they're really playing it up, but they didn't realise that this stuff was from Africa. <laughs> it was pretty deadly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how times have changed. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's going to... Ken Perth actually replaced me from the ferrets, remember? The ferrets? Yeah, yeah. Don't he, fall he, in love, yeah. Yeah, he, he replaced me when I left and joined the Copper Wine. Ah, oh, wow. I was, I was going to say, while, while we're in um, a retrospective mood, what would, be some, what would be some bits of advice that you would like to be able to go back in time and give yourselves? Uh, well, I think my advice would be probably, you know, kind of knuckle down and get the reading thing sorted out a bit, bit more, you know. I mean, I discovered when I was eight years old that I had a really good ear and, and that's kind of kept me in good stead all my life, you know. I kind of, I hear a song and go, you know, I'd be listening to the radio and actually visualise myself kind of playing it. I would hear it and hear where the changes were going. I mean, even when I was having piano lessons as a kid, you know, I used to, with a nun, I'd go there, I was like seven years old playing piano, you know, and, and I'd, I'd go for my daily, weekly lesson. And I'd come in very proud because I'd, I could now play this piece, you know, but it, what, I, I, what I was doing was learning my version of it, you know, so I'd sit down and play and I'd get the rap across the knuckles with the ruler from the nun going, you're not reading that, you know, and I'm thinking, no, I'm not reading it, but it sounds pretty bloody good, doesn't it, you know. <laughs> so I think my advice would be to, uh, you know, you know, if you're going to throw yourself out there and, and, you know, Craig, you know, like do live television, I mean. Like, you, you, I mean, you've done live TV. I know, but, you know, I, I wouldn't... I look, yeah, I, I'm looking, the more you read, the better you get at it. There's no doubt about it, but it was kind of... Um, you know, I mean, mind you, a lot of those charts you're using for an arrangement, you're not necessarily, you know, at the end of the day, you've got to use your ears. If, if, if what you're reading is not working, you've got to make changes. But at, uh, least, you've got, at least you've got a roadmap. Oh, of course, yeah. Yeah. You know. And normally, you know, I'd, I'd always kind of fudge through it, you know. You know sometimes there'd, there'd be a chord symbol there and I'd see a run of notes that I knew. I mean, I remember early days of doing sessions, you know, and uh, and and it would go like doing a jingle and, and there'd be a line to play and I'm going, oh, what the hell's that? 
And the first run through, I'd kind of muff it a bit, and I realised that the brass players <clears throat> were playing the same line. So in the quick break, I'd grab my chart and go over to the to the to the brass players and say, "Now look, I think we're playing the same thing. Can you just can you play me what you've got?" And they'd play it, and I'd memorise it and go back to my my station and, and for the next run through and regurgitate what I heard, you know. So yep. I was using all sorts of tricks of the trade, you know, even an orchestra session sometimes, you know, full orchestra movie score stuff where it was really heavy going, you know. Uh, I, I'd sidle over to the to the upright bass section and, and uh, ask them to play what they're playing with my chart in hand just to kind of hear it and go, oh, yeah, okay, that's what I should be doing and go back. Like pretty quick then to make some little marks on your chart, you know. That's well, thing. actually, more than anything, just use my ears and use my head and memorise it, you know. I think yeah, so that would be my, if I had to go back and do it again, I, I think would be, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe at certain times take things a bit more seriously, you know. You know, you find yourself in an amazing situation and think, well, maybe I didn't wasn't as professional as I could have been, you know. Uh, they were pretty wild times then, you know, early 70s. And, you know, look, I mean, look at the stuff that Harry was getting up to, you know. And, <laughs> <laughs> and But he's still here, so it's all right. <laughs> well, of course it's all right, you know. <laughs> I mean, look, it's funny, Craig, you were talking about Hey, Hey, it's Saturday. I digress, but I, um, I remember, and you probably remember too, and Hey, and I know, Craig, you don't remember this, but Hey, Hey, it's Saturday was, was a morning show, a Saturday morning show. And it used to start at 8 o'clock in the morning till 11 in, in the 70s. And you know, I'd remember going out doing a gig with LRB and, you know, getting partying up pretty hard after the, the gig Friday night and then, like, waking up real early, like 6 o'clock, 6.30 in the morning, drag yourself out of bed, get down to the Channel 9 studios for a rehearsal at 7.30, 7 o'clock, you know. Uh, sometimes playing live, we're probably miming at those times, you know. But man, that they were, they were crazy days. You know, just doing live television at nine o'clock on the Saturday morning with a hell of a hangover, you know. Yeah, well, <laughs> just digressing again. I mean, Dancing with the Stars, which is another show that I did uh, 16, 17 seasons of. We would start at eight o'clock in the morning, sometimes even earlier. Oh. Yeah. I mean, the show the show wasn't going to to air until seven o'clock that evening. It's a long uh, day, isn't it? You'd be in there, you know, uh, running the charts down. Then the dancers would come in, they'd do their thing. Then the TV crew would want to run. So, yeah, you know, it was a completely different situation. You actually got to play the tunes more than enough times. It's like I don't want to play this tune anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do the gig sort of thing. Yeah, you've got to kind of really vibe yourself up then, haven't you? You know, if you've been at it all day and it's like you're tired. And also with that show, you know, we were getting, because of technology, uh, we would get a copy of the songs, you know, the night before or the day before, whatever. So you'd actually get a chance to uh, listen to, oh, okay, this is a P-bass sound with a pick or this is a, you know, I need to work for this. Yeah. You actually get a bit of time to uh, figure out a few things. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. I think I think what what you were saying, Craig and Roger, about the the ears and the reading, like if you <clears throat> if you can do both, then that's ultimately where you want to be. You don't want to be solely just stuck in the page and unaware of what's going on, but also you don't want to be so glued to what's going on around you that you might miss you know something detailed in your part so I, I always think that having the best of both worlds is is where you want to be oh, absolutely and i yeah. think as, as a bass player you're in the rhythm section so yeah you've got to be able to read but you've got to be able to as you say sometimes you you look at the chart and going well i don't know about that yeah you know, the cry would usually go up who wrote this shit oh, oh, oh it was you daryl sorry <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. you, you can always tell when it's been written by a piano player you know? Oh, yeah, very busy in the left hand, and weird intervals that you can't get your hands around. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You see, you're right, you learn to adapt, and, you know, and, and, you know, I think with all the reading and all the stuff, it was all about laying down, for me, it was all about laying down the groove, a solid foundation. So if I missed a few lines, you know, you learn to kind of muff stuff 
real clean, you know, just things you might just glide over, but it's all about landing back down on the one, you know. Mm. I've got to tell you uh, my Melbourne uh, Aussie Crawl story when I uh, got the gig with Aussie Crawl with Watto, my uh, very good friend, basically he was rang up and said, oh, listen, uh, there's this song we just can't help get a groove in, you know, and uh, I told the guys about you and so how about coming down and doing the track? So I went down and did the track. They said, oh, yeah, well, there's another song here that's just... So after about three weeks of me backwards and forwards, I'd done the whole, just about the whole album and I, f I felt a bit bad because the, uh, the bass player obviously isn't going to play this stuff because it was a lot more, say advanced musically they had the earth wind and fire horns they had oh man seriously it was really yeah it was it was an amazing album wow. what year was that <laughs> sorry I, that was uh, 1985 and, and i was in the green room and red simon came in and said you scum putting our melbourne musicians out of work <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that'd be right <laughs> I'm this bass player thinking, is he serious or like? <laughs> <laughs> but basically, uh, I, I got the call up that join, which was about 18 months of incredible fun because they were, they were really fun guys to hang with because they weren't that serious. James was the only one that was really serious about the music because he, he would go back to his room and start writing songs, whereas the, the other guys were out there partying and having a great time. So... It was was amazing to to hang out with a great bunch of guys, get paid so well, and and even having roadies just put the bass on you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. you know, man, that's that's. Hand a, me my bass. Yeah. Hand me my wine. <laughs> <laughs> and a new set of rotor rotor sounds every week. So when yeah. I, when, the, when the gig finished, I had a whole box full of rotor sounds. Yeah, yeah. nice. And that, and, and that would have been a, a young John Watson then. He it was. I think it was a, a thank you for getting him to a Renee Gaya band in the early days when yeah, I was what a 19. Drums. And yeah. uh, I mean, John is just as solid as they come. You know, he's like John Robinson in America. You know, from yeah, uh, he is man. Yeah, yeah. He, he's he's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. I've done a lot of sessions with Watto over the years. He always played really straight, just really simple, minimalistic stuff. And one day asked me to play in a funk band. And, and I went, oh, yes, be great. And I would launch it. You know, no practice. You just turn up. Oh, we're doing this. We've done that. A few charts. Listen to that. And, and, and I didn't realize how funky Watto is, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, he's got like, a pop. Because I'd, I'd only been in the studio with the you know, click track. Gah, you know, simple stuff and all of a sudden I never knew he had all these chops and he's really funky you know yeah well you know the other drummer that was incredibly funky with Renee is Mark Kennedy yeah yeah and he, he, right. he he's probably the most fearless, fearless drummer I've ever met in my life because yeah he would take the biggest risks and always come in like a butterfly you know it was a, <laughs> so I actually I actually you know the in the full-on Renee days, I would realise sometimes that I would get to the accent a fraction before Mark. And it used to bug me big time, and I thought, I've got to sort this out. So slowly watching Mark, I finally licked it and was ending up smack on because that accents, when you when you hit them a slightly earlier, it actually hurts you. <laughs> you know, you, you feel this is not, you know, out of the pocket, so you it, it affects you. Yeah. Well, look, we're very lucky, mate, because Mark Kennedy now lives in Melbourne. Yeah, well, I still think... Yeah, and I've been getting to play with him a bit over the last few years. It's been really cool. And I saw him a couple of years ago, and he's still unbelievable, you know. He, he, he's so free. He, he, he's incredible. With Renee, Renee used to love playing with him, mainly because he, Renee was all about unpredictability. She, I, it was one of those gigs where I would never play the same lines any night. Every night was approached different with different lines, and she loved that because wow. it, it sent her into another way of performing the song. She didn't want it to be a, a reproduction, so she was right into you. And, and I'm talking about fooling around with the song big time. She always loved that. Oh, look, he's you know giving her some something to work off. Yes. But she generally had this uh, probably one of the only singers that I've 
met that was like that, who wanted, who wanted the unpredictability. Yeah, cool. Um, I know it would be remiss of me not to ask you, Harry, about Jamerson. Uh, uh, life, love life love book. I mean, I, well, surely I'm pretty sure everybody on this call and hopefully everybody watching has some kind of love affair with James Jamerson. And it's, yeah, we it's, all have. I'm still trying to figure out how to play his lines. <clears throat> you know what? Well, you know, I started, I started studying Jamerson around 1968 when I finally got, I was made to love her with Stevie Wonder. I thought, wow, oh, my God. Mm. And uh, basically I realised that you cannot get that full Jamison flavour the way the modern guys do it. Mm. It's basically his action was ridiculous. He loosened off his truss rod so that was a bow and he had the heaviest strings on the planet, those, those deep talking strings. So but basically he would just, yeah, there they are. Deep talking bass. Yeah. He would do all that with downstrokes on one finger and, and it would blow my mind because that's why if you even listen to it on AM radio, Motown, he pops out of those speakers. Yep. Now, sure now the modern bass is gone, lost, lost in the mix. It's, you hear it on the big FM stations when it's booming on the bottom end, but you put it on an AM station and there's no bass. Basically, it's, it's lost, whereas those, those 70s guys, even guys like Jerry Sheff from uh, Elvis Presley, and they, they projected a, a precision sound that popped out, out of the speakers. And then I, I think it was not so much the recording, it was in their hands. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny you should mention that. Sorry to interrupt, but I was listening to <clears throat> just a bunch of songs today and Average White Band came on. That, um, you know, the bizarrely funky white... Scottish yes. band <laughs> and you know it wasn't it didn't sound as big or as loud or as bombastic as some of the other stuff that had been on before but everything had everything had its place everything had space and you, you could hear you could hear the entire note of the bass if that makes sense and I think that's similar to the the kind of Motown vibe yeah well yeah, that's, that's because of the, of the pick approach because that's all pick so basically uh it cuts through beautifully. You know, a pick and a precision is an incredible combination. You know, it's like yeah. some of those 70s, uh, 60s records like uh, Nancy Sinatra, all those boots are made for walking. Listen, that pick sound, I'm, I, I love it. So, yeah. uh, a weapon of base destruction. <laughs> yeah. A trusty pick. Yeah, I can dig it, man. I, you know, people go, oh, you know, you're not a real bass player if you use a pick. And I go, bah, humbug, you know. Yeah. I still use a pick today on certain songs. You know, I love the sound of a pick. You can palm mute. There's so much you can do with it, you know. Yeah, well, you know, it opens up a lot of new areas, you know. Yeah. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed that part one of the three-hour extravaganza episode with... Roger McLaughlin, Harry Bruss, and Craig Newman. Um, stay tuned. Part two should be right up after this. Thanks for listening. Um, please share this around, leave a review, subscribe, all that good stuff. Um, check me out on Instagram, Bass Lessons Melbourne. Buy my new album, Refraction, with my band Pickpocket. Or stream it on Spotify, whatever you like. All right, see you soon.